I am delighted to welcome all of you to tonight's event, The New Monetary Regime, a panel discussion on debt and inflation. I'm Richard Reinch. I'm the editor of Law and Liberty, Liberty Fund's online journal devoted to <coughs> law and political thought. The occasion or the inspiration for our discussion this evening should be obvious. We have now gone through nearly $5 trillion in pandemic stimulus spending. We have $2 trillion on deck from the Biden administration, and we are promised even more. This, of course, comes on the heels of nearly 40 years of America being a debtor nation. This says nothing about our great structural debts owing to our entitlement state, all of which leaves us in a precarious position. But of course, we now have a new group of modern monetary theorists, so-called, who want to bring a firm philosophical foundation to this spending, who urge there should be really no constraints uh, to what the government does in terms of uh, these policies, um, and also who insist that it's money we all owe ourselves anyway, so why does it matter? Well, indeed. So to discuss all of these issues, we've assembled a great panel here tonight, and we will uh, introduce them shortly. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Law and Liberty is published by Liberty Fund. We're filming this event tonight from Liberty Fund, one of our co-sponsors, along with the Real Clear Foundation. Liberty Fund's mission for the past 60 years is to develop the ideas that undergird a society of free and responsible persons. We have done that through thousands of Socratic education conferences, through publishing hundreds of books, and in the last 20 years, we have also been devoted to web publishing. So that's how we pursue that uh, mission. Um, uh, let me also uh, welcome David DeRoser from the Real Clear Foundation, one of our sponsors who will be here. As I mentioned, Law and Liberty, we're devoted to law, political thought and culture, and the classical liberal tradition. We've been considering all of these issues for some time as well, so we're delighted to be a part of this event tonight. Uh, and with that, I will introduce or let, turn it over to David Day Rozier, uh, who can tell you about Real Clear Foundation, the CEO of Real Clear Politics, and we'll keep moving forward. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Liberty Fund. It's a personal joy f uh, for me that our respective organizations are collaborating to bring this very important public conversation uh, you know, to the world. Um, I'm a big fan of Liberty Fund. I've been a fan of you guys since you know for 25 years now. Uh, Liberty Fund's library of books and the Socratic method that it uses to bring them to life are a global treasure. And we owe a great thanks to Pierre Goodrich, uh, the, the gentleman who had a love of liberty, a love of books, and you know, a love of the ability to make money and put it in the service of an institution such like this. Um, COVID and the Socratic me method don't mix. So I, I know it's probably been very hard for the people like me who have grown very uh, you know, close to the Liberty Fund over years not to be able to kind of get together in the way that it's supposed to be done. But I think we're going to do a good job today, and I think we're at the beginning of a new, new normal. So look forward to getting back. Um, to give you a sense of just how close of a connection that I have to the Liberty Fund, I wrote my dissertation on an author who was in the library of books that you guys could check out. Uh, his name was Bertrand de Juvenal, and he just gave a quote, and I want to share a quote that he had, that I think just really kind of frames, you know, the type of people that we have around this table, but also the challenge that the, the people around this table have. He said that like, the, the role of a political scientist is to, is to really just, it's, it's to see those clouds no bigger, on, uh, no bigger than a man's fist from which the tempest will come. He used Shakespeare, obviously, to kind of make that point. And what I think is characteristic of everyone here is that we have some great political meteorologists in the room, polit uh, political and economic meteorologists. I have, uh, I have uh, the easy task of introducing uh, Alex Pollack, you know, the guy who's running that meteorological team at the other end of the table. And uh, it, as Chris can attest, because Chris ran one of the best think tanks in the, in the country, AEI, you know, Alex has a very unique career and resume path. You know, it's very rare that you go from CEO to pol uh, policy wonk. You know, sometimes you go from crackhead to CEO, but we never see anybody go from really CEO to policy wonk. And it reminded me of the story uh, of a Greek philosopher, Thales. Thales was a pre-Socratic, pretty much, you know, kind of known for their understanding of the way the world worked. And one day a woman rebuked him and said, if you're so smart, why are you so poor? 
And because he knew the way the world works, he knew that there was going to be a particularly good olives harvest. And so he went out there and he bought up all the leases for the, uh, for the olive presses. And he went from being a very poor man to a very rich man. I think Alex did it right. He went out and made money first. Right? And then after that, he dedicated his life to the service of public service. And, and while I'm sure your, your, your Mandarin salary of a, of a think tanker is, is good, I bet it doesn't compare to what you gave up when you put yourself in the service of us. Um, one of the things I thought and I gleaned from his bio was that he, he, among his interests, he says, I have an interest in clarity. And as someone who's just refinanced his mortgage at these historical lows, I did benefit from the one pager that you were able to kind of get pushed into, you know, our economic lexicon. And for that, I thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, David, very much. And as a former student of philosophy, I've always loved that story of Thales, how he made money by monopolizing the, uh, the olive presses that year. Uh, so many thanks uh, to Real Clear. Media Foundation and of the Liberty Fund for organizing this exceptionally timely discussion of inflation debt and the new monetary regime, uh, which raises issues critical in economics, finance, and political philosophy, and critical to the welfare of the Republic. The distinguished central banking expert Charles Goodhart, with co-author Manoj Pradhan, wrote in their new book, Looking Forward from 2020, as they were writing, quote, what will happen when the lockdown gets lifted and recovery ensues following a period of massive fiscal and monetary expansion? The answer, as in the aftermaths of many wars, will be a surge in inflation." Unquote. Directionally, this seems to me a very good forecast. About the coming inflation rate, they continue, quote, quite likely more than 5% even on the order of 10 percent, unquote. About the 5 percent, I note that the annualized increase in the U.S. Consumer Price Index for the first quarter of this year was greater than 6 percent, the first quarter annualized. Well, what about that 10 percent? Could we go back to a 10 percent inflation? Well, we've been there before. I remind you, in 1917 to 1920, 1947, 1974, and 1979 to 81. Uh, we'll see what the panel thinks about that idea, if they uh, feel like forecasting. Goodhart and Pradhan proceeded to ask, what will the response of the authorities then be? And they made the following prediction, quote, first and foremost, they will claim this is a temporary and once for all blip, unquote. And we already know that that prediction was correct. Concerning the central bank's hopes or rationalizations, our colleague David Goldman wrote yesterday in the Asia Times, quote, inflation is coming or more precisely it's here. And the only question is when the market ceases to believe the Fed's story. Uh, perhaps this evening, David, you'll, you'll tell us when that sensation of unjustified belief might happen. Of course, inflation has already been here for some time in the inflation of asset prices, pumped up and stoked by the combined money printing efforts of all the major central banks. Do they dare stop now and risk deflating asset prices? U.S. house prices, for example, a huge and politically sensitive asset market, are far over their housing bubble peak and rapidly inflating at 11% a year. Yet, the Fed is adding $40 billion a month, that is $480 billion a year, to its more than $2 trillion portfolio of long-term mortgages, amplifying its role as the world's biggest savings and loan. Why is it still buying? What would mortgage interest rates, and therefore house prices, be without its constant big bid in the mortgage market. Uh, earlier this month, Greg Ip correctly wrote in the Wall Street Journal that exceptionally low interest rates are essential to the government's exploding debt. So he wrote, quote, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is the single most important player 
in Bidenomics, unquote. Indeed, a fiat currency central bank is the handiest thing for an ambitious government to have, and all governments are Nixonian in their desire to get the central bank to do what they want. In a larger sense, we are all Nixonians now, because we all take for granted the global monetary system he created in August 1971, a world which operates at all times in peace as well as war on pure fiat currencies. And it is this which allows the amazing expandability of contemporary central bank balance sheets and correspondingly government debt. Is there any limit to the size of the Fed's balance sheet? Richard mentioned this new so-called theory that says there isn't. The Fed's balance sheet now rounds to $8 trillion, rounding to the nearest trillion. Is there any limit to the deficits the government can run? The lovers of unlimited government are anxious to say no. Others of us think the limit will be in the coming destructive inflation, and we'll find out this evening what the panel thinks. A related question is what, if anything, is new or true in the so-called modern monetary theory, which you referred to. I always write that with modern in quotes, quote modern, unquote, monetary theory, because I think the, the ideas are very old indeed. Now, I propose two principles relevant to our discussion. First, the most basic proposition in economics, nothing is free. Second, Pollock's law of finance, which is debts which, uh, debts which cannot be paid will not be paid. From these principles, I conclude it will not be free to get out of the government's unpayable debts, and they will ultimately be settled by implicit default for the most part, that is, high inflation and depreciation of the value of the currency and extreme depreciation of long-term contracts denominated in money. Uh, now, that view of mine is consistent with those of many Bitcoin enthusiasts who want to escape the central bank's currencies. Might that really happen? A private cryptocurrency escape the national currencies? Or will our governments instead, as China is already planning, and the Fed and many others are studying, take over digital currencies themselves? And if they do, with what consequences? In any case, unlimited government, unlimited debt, and a monetary system based on an unlimited fiat currency central banks are intertwined, and Leviathan swells mightily with a combination of crisis and fiat money. To address the many essential questions involved in our topic this evening, we have three truly distinguished panelists. Each will make an opening uh, statement of about 15 minutes, and then we'll move to questions and discussion. Uh, let me introduce the panel in the order in which they will speak. Uh, first, David Goldman, who is an economist and provocative author on many subjects, including the decline of civilizations and China's plan to Sinoform the world. He's the deputy editor business of the Asia Times and has held senior positions at Credit Suisse, Bank of America, and Cantor Fitzgerald. In addition to his work in economics and finance, he has studied and written on music, but he doesn't seem to enjoy the song of the Federal Reserve. Véronique de Rougy is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University with research interests in the U.S. economy, the federal budget, taxation, competition, and cronyism. Previously a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the Cato Institute, Veronique has written recently of, quote, this president's insane propensity for unconstrained government spending, unquote, a good link to this conference, Veronique, and, and Chris DeMuth. Chris was the president of the American Enterprise Institute for 22 years, from 1986 to 2008, during which time he built AEI into a top intellectual and policy force. 
as has been mentioned, while running AEI, at one point he took a chance and hired me. Known for his elegant writing, Chris is now a distinguished fellow at the Hudson Institute. He previously served in the Nixon and Reagan administrations and is a lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. We look forward to a great discussion. And David, you have the floor. Alex, thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm honored to be here. I want to thank the Liberty Fund and Real Clear Foundation for the honor of being part of this distinguished group. I'd like to make three points in 15 minutes. The first is that this is political. It's not a natural or physical process. The second is that this is not a drill. This is the real thing. Like the tagline from the movie The Fly, we should be afraid, very afraid. And the third is that a fundamental difference between this crisis and all other past crises is that we have China to contend with, which is waiting in the wings to take advantage of our mistakes uh, and our misery. It certainly was justified under conditions of an exogenous shock due to a, a viral pandemic for the Federal Reserve uh, and the government to put a great deal of money to sustain demand in the short term which the Trump administration did and the Federal Reserve did during the Trump administration. When you have a natural disaster, which in effect this was, extraordinary spending is uh, justified. However, this pattern of support for the economy has been hijacked for political reasons by the Biden administration, which is attempting to make it a permanent feature of economic life. When I say permanent, I think would guess that the Democrats are crossing their fingers that they can get to the next congressional election, having paid off every constituency now lined up at the trough before the thing blows up and then worry about what they're going to do next. But first, fundamentally, we have a political problem. The second issue, when I say this is not a drill, the solution to every crisis has the seeds of the next crisis. Go back to 2008. 2008, um, I was, uh, I had just uh, left a career on Wall Street um, as research director for several firms. Uh, I was one of the minority of economists who believed that we would have a systemic crisis in 2008 because the leverage attached to the household sector and the corporate sector in the United States was unsustainable. Americans were using uh, home equity loans as an ATM machine to sustain very high levels of consumption. The credit quality associated with derivatives of these home equity loans, which have been highly levered in the banking system, uh, was enormous. And at the time when the, Ob the then well, the then Bush administration proposed an $800 billion price tag for bailing the banking system out. The American public and the world were stunned. Now, we are already almost an order of magnitude larger in our commitment than the bailout required to do that. Now, remember, back in 2008, Government debt was, what, 40, 50 percent of gross domestic product, as opposed to, what, 120 percent by the end of the current fiscal year? Astonishing levels for the United States, something with deficits we haven't seen except during the Second World War. Because the federal debt was rock solid and was a refuge of stability and the whole world wanted to buy it, it was not that difficult for the government to bail out the bank's and households and so forth, who were the epicenter of the crisis in 2008. What's different today is U.S. government debt is becoming the epicenter of the crisis. There's no one to bail us out. The best comparison would be to Italy in 2018 during its financial crisis, with the difference, of course, that Italy had the rich and financially stable northern countries of the European Union, principally Germany and Holland, to bail it out. 
And unless there are Martians who have lots of money and like us that we haven't talked to yet, there's no one to bail us out in this case. And the third is the issue of China. I, I think China's role in this is, is widely misunderstood. China has no intention of becoming the United States or of making its RMB the equivalent of the U.S. dollar and repeating the American, what it sees as the American imperial experiment. It plans to do something entirely different and create a very different kind of monetary system which, in which digital currencies would mesh with uh, digital control of trade and inventory and financing down to the micro level uh, using Chinese technology and under Chinese dominance. It's a very different system. Let's talk for a second about what's happening in the U.S. Treasury market. And I speak as a Wall Street strategist, not as an academic economist. The when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt in September of 2008, the yield on the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond fell by roughly a percentage point because it was the last refuge of stability in the financial system and everybody wanted to own ultra-safe treasury bonds because they didn't trust other forms of uh, securities. When the COVID crisis hit in February and March of 2020, the yield on the 30-year treasury bond rose by roughly a percentage point because the world was unable to hold it. Why is this the case? We had exactly the opposite reaction. The epicenter of the crisis was in the Treasury market. What happened was forced liquidations. This is a point that Paul Volcker used to like to make. We've created a monetary system with enormous instability, currency fluctuations, interest rate fluctuations, and unpredictability. And businessmen who have to conduct transactions across currencies or over time can't deal with the uncertainty of that. So we've created an insurance market of, with a gross value of $600 trillion for interest rates. That's the size of the interest rate derivatives market gross or with a net value of $15 trillion worth of insurance policies. And that market uh, hedges interest rate and currency fluctuations. But the existence of that market depends on the banking system's ability to extend credit to people to put these hedges in place. In February and March, there was a run on credit at American banks. Every corporation in the U.S. took drew down loans which it had a right to draw down. It had, they had revolving credit lines. They were, piling, they were stockpiling cash. That created a cash shortage among banks who had to pull the financing for hedges to the world banking system, to European and Japanese banks, and that forced massive liquidation of treasury holdings by the foreigners who had bailed us out after 2008, now $8 trillion worth of treasury securities. That's when the Federal Reserve came in and bought $4 trillion worth of securities to substitute for that. The Federal Reserve, for the first time ever, was the only real buyer in the market during 2020. During the Obama years, foreigners bought 50% of the increase in debt that the U.S. government issued to stimulate the economy and bail out the banks. Foreigners have been net sellers of Treasury securities, not only because the Federal Reserve pushed the rates down so far that they're not attractive, but because foreigners buying Treasury securities with cash flows in yen or euros or other currencies can't hedge them anymore because the banking system can't provide the hedges. Now, at some point, and I, I unfortunately, you know, I can't tell you where it is. If I knew that, I'd be phoning in orders from my yacht in Monte Carlo as opposed to talking to you here tonight. At some point, we're going to see a blowout of the <laughs> Treasury market because if the Federal Reserve is the only buyer, at some point, everyone is going to say, fine, let them buy my Treasury securities while they're still worth something so I can get out and buy something else, whether it's gold or Bitcoin or 
physical raw materials or houses or whatever. Uh, that's already beginning to happen slowly at the edges. We've had a uh, roughly percentage point increase in treasury yields from the bottom of the market between August and the present as inflation goes up. <coughs> uh, and at that point, with the treasury market uh, collapsing, yields will go up. The collateral in the banking system that's used to uh, back up this gross $600 trillion worth of derivatives contracts will shrink and we'll see the kind of event that we saw when an equity manager named Bill Huang, who had a great deal of leverage in his equity portfolio, went from a net worth of $20 billion to a net worth of zero a couple of weeks ago with considerable losses for the banks who'd lent him money. And that's going to cause uh, a world recession. Now, how much inflation will there be? Uh, it's very hard to know because Prices are already going up at the fastest rate since the high inflation of the 1970s, according to the Philadelphia Federal Reserve survey, which is the most respected and followed uh, by, by high-frequency economists. Uh, the input costs to manufacturers have gone up faster than any year since a, a blip in 1973, so that's alarming. We throw trillions of dollars, the $5 trillion, uh, uh, of stimulus into the economy, and several things happen. We've got productive capacity that can't keep up with the demand. So our imports go to a record. Our imports from China are at an all-time record on a 12-month basis. Despite the tariffs, despite our attempts to decouple from China, we've recoupled, and inputs are extremely hard to find across the board. Now, two th one of two things can happen. People can either pay higher prices or they balk at the prices, and instead of getting inflation, we get stagflation, where the increase in prices cuts directly into output, as opposed to turning into realized price increases, because people can't do that. So by shifting <clears throat> the burden of the financial crisis from home equity loans and corporate bonds and collateralized debt obligations and bank special purpose vehicles as in 2008, which were a mere $800 billion price tag, we now have a multi-trillion dollar price tag, which is too large even for the United States to handle. So let me read you one estimate of what's going to happen. Simply put, this year the United States has issued a massive amount of currency, which has given the U.S. economy a certain kind of survival power. On the short term, this method is highly effective. The U.S. stock market hit a record high. But I want to emphasize this approach comes at the cost of the future effectiveness of the dollar lending system. You don't get the benefit without the costs. A hegemonic country can maintain its currency hegemony for a period of time even after national hegemony has been lost. Talks about Britain. It, it continues... We see the U.S. dollar as the most important national currency in the international payment system may still persist for a time even after U.S. hegemony ends. Since this year, the U.S. has continued to issue more currency to ease the internal situation. The pressure will eventually seriously damage the status of the U.S. dollar as the core currency in the international payment system. The speaker is Fudan University Shanghai, of Shanghai Professor Bai Gong, in an interview with the Guangxia.com, or Observer website, which is basically a discussion group for the Chinese State Council. So China believes that the United States is going to sit back and wait for the low-hanging fruit to collapse and then come in and try to do things entirely differently. Now, what does that mean practically? And this is the last thing I'll have to say because I think I'm going over my time. You're right on your perfect on your time. There is a concept called seigneurage, which is the benefits of having a reserve currency. It, it used to be the extra money that a king got from turning bullion into coins. The coins had a higher value. The fact that international trade is mainly denominated in dollars means that the whole world holds reserve balances in dollars. People hold $8 trillion worth of treasuries. And my rough guess is that there are $16 trillion worth of dollar bank deposits in the international banking system based on the Bank for International Settlements data, which are there 
just as working capital for international trade. That's roughly $25 trillion of low or zero interest loans to the United States of America. And if the, this infects the dollar's reserve rule, as the Chinese predict, then a great deal of those loans will cease to be available to us, will lose seniorage roughly equivalent to a year's gross domestic, domestic product exactly at the point when we're trying to borrow the equivalent of 15 to 20 percent of our gross domestic product on an annual basis to fund the deficit. These are flabbergasting numbers and it can't possibly end well. So I conclude by hoping that I've scared you and communicated a sense of urgency about the political origins of the mess that we're in and the worst mess that we're about to get into. Thank you. Thank you, David. Let me I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, Alex, I think, I mean, he took much more risk by hiring me than by hiring you. <laughs> Both, they both had big upside. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, David. It's a pleasure meeting you. I'm I'm a big uh, fan of Liberty Fund and everything real clear, um, and so it's really an honor to be here. Um, I am not uh, as much a financial uh, sector expert as as all of you are, but I know a little bit about the economics of of the debt. And, and spending, which is um, basically the, the, I mean, debt is a symptom of, of, of overspending. Um, but today I want to actually talk about uh, several things. One of the things that I actually find interesting is how um, really ideas shape the world and how fast we go from one goal to another. And I remember it, was, it wasn't so long ago, uh, 2010, that actually uh, reducing the debt and deficit and cutting spending was the goal, that, and, and that's where everyone had their eyes on. And now, um, 21 years later, effectively you have academics and you have uh, pundits that are saying the debt doesn't matter um, and, uh, and we can spend in their extreme form, those uh, guys are saying that we can spend absolutely as much as we want and without fearing any consequences. So today I want to actually do two things. Um, the first one is I want to actually say that while if it is true that there hasn't been, you know, the kind of um, obvious sign that people who are not specialists obvious signs of inflation that people who aren't specialists and looking at the data the way you guys are looking at, um, they've just no sign of actually really kind of like as much inflation as we would think uh, they would be considering what has happened. And while interest rates are still extremely low and, and really have been decreasing in spite of massive deficits uh, for, for decades really, um, why actually we shouldn't actually rest on our laurels. And, and actually that this, this idea that because they're low now, because there are no sign that they're really, they may be going up anytime soon, uh, actually doesn't actually tell you anything about whether they're gonna go up eventually and we're gonna end up really in a debt crisis. But then I wanna do something else where I'll feel much more comfortable and much more in my, in my, um, in my comfort zone, which is like, I wanna actually talk about all the reasons why we should be worried about the debt, even if on the very in, in, you know, unlikely scenario that interest rates never go up and, and we don't get hit with hyperinflation. And because actually debt has a big, big cost independently of all of this. So I'll start with the debt and, the debt and uh, interest rates and inflation. This is a part of my talk where I'm not you know, I, I saw the invite for the talk, I got invited, and I saw the word debt, and I said, of course I'll come. And then I realized that there were like monetary, <laughs> there were several monetary words in there, and I was like, oh, uh-oh. But, you know, it was too late. And so I just take, <laughs> <Luckily for us. laughs> take it with a, with a grain of salt, and actually a lot of this is, is more like um, an inquiry on my part. But it is true, right? I mean, it's like we have had decreasing interest rates in spite of high deficits. Um, 
there are a lot of respected, not, not the kind, the, the mon modern monetary uh, theories type, or as, as uh, John Cochran at Hoover called them, the magic monetary theories, um, who actually are making the case that if you lo look, for instance, at the Cleveland Fed number, I mean, the projected inflation for the next average for the next five years is going to be 1.5 or 6 uh, percent. I mean, I, I don't know whether it's true, but there are actually respected people who actually uh, are throwing numbers like this, saying, you know, in the next five years, you shouldn't be worried about inflation. Interest rates are going to stay low. Um, uh, I mean, I'll point out that as other Federal Reserves, you know, have very different numbers. I mean, the, the New York Fed and, and others have actually much higher number and are not so optimistic about these numbers. But I think that no matter what the numbers are today, it could be what it, we could be in a process that Arnold Kling, one of my colleagues, talked about as the guy who has jumped from the 10th floor. And on the second floor, when he's asked, how are you right now? He's like, so far, so good. Right? And that's what Cochran, again, uh, at Hoover talks about. He talks about how the people living in California on the, on the earthquake fault, you know, you know they're, they're, they haven't had the big earthquake not now. And it certainly doesn't mean it will never happened. And I think that's absolutely correct. I think it is absolutely correct. There's got to be a limit out there. It is true that right now, investors are still willing to lend us with 100% debt to GDP ratio at very low rate. But can we say for a fact, like a lot of people are saying, that they will continue doing it 200% of GDP, which, which is going to be in less than, than uh, 30 years. No, we, we can't say this. There's got to be, even the debt arc, like Olivier Blanchard, who used to be the head of the IMF, I mean, they all admit that there is a limit out there. And the fact that we don't know exactly when it's going to be doesn't mean it is going to happen. And, and that, I think, is, um, is important to know. And um, the other thing that I think is important to point out, and, and David alluded to this a little bit, is that there are a lot of people who are um, taking a lot of comfort in the fact that we are not seeing any signaling right now in interest rates or in inflation rates that things could go really bad. But actually, those rates really never tell you anything. The Greek government could borrow at fairly low rates very, very close to when they couldn't. Lehman Brothers, they could, they could borrow at very low rates until they couldn't. Um, rates didn't signal the deflation of the 1980s. I mean, and, and all sorts of things over and over and over again. So we shouldn't actually take much comfort in predictions, even really solid, you know, uh, people really looking at data that, that makes a lot of, uh, that make a lot of sense about you know in the next five years we're going to be okay because really rates as they are right now don't tell you very much about when they're going to change because when things change it's going to change pretty fast and the other thing is that debt crisis take a fairly long time to develop and I will admit that I have like others said for a long time that we would have had this crisis for now. I mean, I was, I was really wrong. But again, because someone like me has been wrong, doesn't mean that it will never, ever <laughs> happen, right? In fact, I find it remarkably interesting when you look at the literature of Carmen Reinhardt, who was an economist and her, and her co-authors at the IMF, they went and looked back at the financial crisis and how government have disposed or decreased uh, debt to GDP ratio over time, looking at history. And she identif they identify, uh, the two of them, five things. Economic growth, the implementation of austerity measures, um, default, uh, financial recession, uh, repression, and surprise burst of inflation. And I was reading actually in uh, Law and Liberty, an article by Arnold Klingware that pointed me out to that, to that article by Reinhardt and her co-author. And Kling makes actually a really, really valid point, which is he actually runs through the, different t the, the five different things and he actually talks about how, why austerity, considering the political uh, 
uh, climate. Apparently, there's absolutely no will uh, for austerity measure. Uh, it's going to get harder and harder as we are going to see uh, to grow out of this mess because first, the mess is so big that just we're not going to grow out of this mess. Um, no matter what um, my Republicans' friends want to say, if only we cut taxes even more, it's not going to happen. Um, financial repression seems um, hard to envision, really, in the US, maybe some form, but not enough to actually really address our problem. And, um, and defaults, like, you know, I mean, it could happen, but in the US, I don't see this happening for a long time. And as such, the surprise burst of inflation seems the most likely. And what is important here is the surprise word. And the reason is, again, that it's actually really hard to predict. It's very, very hard to see in the data. It's very, it's, it's, uh, and otherwise there wouldn't be so many surprise burst of inflation. So. You're so right. You better think about your second. I'm, so, I'm actually right on uh, cue. Okay. I'm going to my second point. <laughs> and my second point is like the debt is very expensive. It's very expensive and we should care about the debt independently of all these issues with the po potential rising interest rates, for instance. In 2020, we pay, the, federal, the federal government paid $378 billion in interest payment. According to the CBO, assuming no wars, no big spending expenditures, which, I mean, considering the infrastructure bill that's going through and, and uh, what this administration has in mind, uh, assuming all sorts of things that would never, ever happen and very, very, very low increase in interest rates, we're going to end up in 20, uh, 2050 with more than 8% of GDP uh, consumed by interest payment. That's $5 trillion. That's way, way more than we spent in, in 2019 as the federal, um, as our entire federal budget. That would mean that 40% of our revenue at the time, again, assuming that nothing happened, will be consumed by, uh, by interest payment. It assumes a growth in interest payment as a share of our budget going from 8% of our budget today to close to 30%, that inevitably means that we're going, something's going to have to give. A lot of spending that people actually like won't be able, in order to avoid the default, won't be able to actually um, happen. That's one thing. The other thing is like for people who don't like high, high taxes, when you have a lot of debt, high deficit, a lot of spending, it makes the possibility of high taxes and new taxes much, much more likely, right? And uh, so that's something that's not great for the economy. The other thing is that even without inflation, deficit, there are several academic studies that show that actually deficit put a lot of pressure upwards on, int on interest rates. So there could be a point where all the factors that actually bring interest rates down actually won't be enough to actually temper the increase in interest rate. And we should, just because of the debt alone, expect higher interest rates. And finally, one that I really care about, because we can't overestimate the importance of an economy that grows, is there's a lot of work that's been done uh, with my colleague uh, Jack Salmon at Mercatus, we've reviewed 40 studies on the issues since the Great uh, uh, Depression, uh, recession, sorry, um, on the impact of the debt on growth. And there's a causation, and it's not insignificant. And, and so there's going to be a lot of crowding out, even if you assume no hyperinflation, no, and, and all of these things we should really care about. And then when you, you, you add all the stuff that David talked about and, and the real risk of uh, interest rates going up and, and inflation uh, really you know, happening, I mean, it is time right now to start doing something about our debt. And, and I'll make a final point, which is for someone like me who cares about small government, I mean, the debt, again, is a symptom of overspending. And we should care about the debt because 
growing debt means a lot of spending, and it actually means an expansion of the size and scope of government. And we should really care about this, government you know, being every single part of our lives. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Veronique. And I, I couldn't agree more about how all the forecasts will be surprised. As a, as a student of financial crises, they're characterized by discontinuous events where everything is going along fine, like, you're, like the guy jumping out the window and then you reach the end. I call that the plank curve because it's the pattern of a man walking the plank. Everything's fine till the last step off the end. Chris. Thank you, Alex. The U.S. federal government followed a balanced budget policy for 180 years. From 18, uh, 1789, the first year of operations through 1969, the policy had three components. Regular operations were paid with current revenues from taxes and tariffs. Borrowing was reserved for wars, other emergencies such as economic depressions, national, natural disasters, uh, and investments in national development, territory, infrastructure. And debts accumulated for these purposes were paid down regularly by subsequent budget surpluses and economic growth. The policy was followed not perfectly by any means, but with impressive consistency until 1970, when the government began to shift to a budget deficit policy in which a significant and growing share of regular operations were paid for with borrowed funds during good times and bad, peace and war, prosperity versus uh, emergencies. Uh, in the uh, 1970s, uh, borrowing became 10% of spending. It averaged 18% in the 80s, and it has been 18% uh, since 2000. 2019 was a year of uh, a strong economic growth at the end of a long expansion. Borrowing was 22% of federal spending. It ballooned to nearly half of spending in the last year's uh, pandemic, but it will stay there in 2021 if uh, the Biden administration's spending proposals are adopted. A half year of a half century of routine uh, deficit spending has left the government far deeper in debt than ever in its history. Uh, the official measure of uh, 28 trillion, uh, much more than uh, a year of current GDP actually understates matters uh, considerably uh, because of many contingencies embedded in the uh, uh, post-war welfare state. Uh, 1.6 trillion in student loans, guarantees behind 9 trillion in home mortgages, a shortfall of revenues to outlays in the big entitlement programs that is well over 100 tri trillion. The change from balanced budgets to budget deficits was a profound quasi-constitutional transformation of American government. But it was never debated in those terms by political leaders because in contrast to similar transformations in the past, uh, the passage of the federal income tax, the Supreme Court's acquiescence in the New Deal, the fiscal transformation was slow and insensible. It came on cat's feet without a defining moment it can be seen for what it was only in hindsight. How did it happen and what does it portend? That old budget balance policy embraced the fundamental rules of sustainable finance that have to be followed by the nation state no less than the family or the business firm uh, or uh, Liberty Fund or the Real Clear Foundation, um, uh, which is to say that uh, over time, uh, 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 revenues, that is income and real resources, must at least equal outlays in real resources, and borrowing must be limited to managing time patterns between outlays and income. The canonical function of borrowing is investment to support expenditures that will generate expectedly, that generate a future income to service the loans. Borrowing may also uh, uh, make sense. Uh, uh, to, it, it to uh, support current consumption, but then future income, apart from returns on the, on the debt fa financed investments, must be sufficient to service the borrowing. That's the primary function of residential mortgage, mortgages and personal finance, 
and in public finance of deficit spending during episodes of war, depression, other emergencies. The point is that deficit spending, unless it finances successful investments or is followed by periods of sufficiently higher income, uh, is unsustainable, as they say. Eventually, outlays will contract, promises will be broken, expectations defeated, resources will be captured and repurposed by creditors or competitors. By this reckoning, the turn toward budget deficits was an ominous development. It is not just that deficits were routine and growing as a share of spending, but the debt was growing and that debt was growing faster than output, but something else was happening. The composition of spending shifted dramatically toward current consumption. In 1970, the beginning of the modern period, 34% of federal spending was in the form of benefits to individuals, Social Security, then new and small Medicare and Medicaid, unemployment compensation, means-tested welfare benefits. Benefit spending then began to grow mightily, and this coincided closely with the growth of deficit spending, and it now accounts for 75% of all federal outlays. But this is not the end of the matter. The government is a nation uh, of a nation such as ours, which is rich and powerful, has unusual flexibility in following uh, the rules of sustainability. Its monopoly of the supply of the world's reserve currency puts it in a very strong position in credit markets. It produces uh, seniorage uh, earnings independent of taxing and borrowing. It enables it to manipulate interest rates, for example, by purchasing its own bonds for, sig for significant, although never certain, periods of time. Most of all, or in addition, the wide range and social nature of the government's involvements muddles the distinction between investment and consumption. When politicians say that spending on food stamps and health care are investments in America's future, I think they're mostly wrong. But when I recycle my Social Security benefits into education savings accounts for my grandchildren, I think I am mostly investing. <laughs> These complications uh, make it uh, 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 difficult to portray without any controversy the fiscal transformation as a fall from financial uh, uh, fiscal transformation as a fall from financial uh, 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 grace. Uh, the government, it is true, followed that policy for 100 years, 180 years, uh, and uh, it sustained a risk-taking, uh, uh, striving uh, nation through several wars and crises that could have been ruinous, but the budget deficit policy has sustained us for another 52 years that included a Cold War endgame, several hot wars, a financial collapse, and a major pandemic. How to, how to explain this? Uh, the debates often ascribe a conscious purpose to policies that I think were primarily adaptations to, say, to changing circumstances. For instance, the advocates of balanced budget policy often describe it as generational husbandry in action. Each generation should avoid burdening future generations and shouldn't instead pay its own way and build capital for the future. In this view, our forebearers were morally upright, far-sighted builders, while we have become a nation of self-absorbed, live-for-the-moment consumers and shirkers. I like the husbandry principle uh, quite a bit myself. I wish it were a central tenet of modern politics and uh, government, but I do not think that the shift from the balanced budget to the budget deficit policy can be satisfactory, exclaimed explained in, in those terms. Although the budget uh, balancing policy was sometimes justified as protecting uh, uh, prosperity, it was actually a, a device for policing government corruption and extravagance in the here and now. Most voters in those days were unable or uninterested, uninterested to follow Washington politics, but knew for certain that they and their neighbors disliked paying taxes. Limiting, limiting spending to revenues, except for conspicuous opportunities, the Louisiana Purchase, or emergencies, the Civil War, the Depression, was therefore a real discipline, and politicians swore by it to demonstrate their devotion to honesty and thrift. 
Contemporary politics is filled with appeals to sacrifice for future generations, as in the global warming uh, debates. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think that uh, uh, we often today continue to use lofty rationalizations for um, immediate, uh, immediate interests. On the other side of the debate are the deficit progressives, proponents of budget deficit policy, what we've been following, presented as the application of sophistication uh, in understanding and manipulating financial markets for the common good. In this view, we have learned that the band, bu balanced budget policy and the rules of sustainable finance are incomplete and short-sighted. Deficit spending is sound policy not only to sustain income and production during serious contractions, um, uh, such as the Depression, the pandemic last year, but whenever output is beneath its potential, which can be calculated and demonstrated by applying econometric metals, map models to aggregate uh, economic data. This kind of fine tuning is said to be sustainable and borrowing from future generations is said to be ethical because we can be certain that future generations will be wealthier than ours and indeed that economic growth will often be greater than government interest rates on borrowed resources. In the more radical formulation of mo modern monetary theory, massive deficit spending is not borrowing from the future at all, but rather investing in the future because it uncorks large reserves of inchoate supply and therefore costlessly generates higher economic growth. There are some easy retorts uh, to the financial enlightenment explanation for where we are. Uh, it is less than obvious that the government's uh, financial management during uh, the budget deficit period has become highly sophisticated and far-sighted, witness the stagflation of the 1970s and the unheralded financial collapse of 2008, both built on sophisticated economic modeling. That the new learning provides reliable po policy guidance is belied by the disagreements among leading financial progressives at every turn in the economic road. Today, this includes sharp differences among Lawrence Summers, Paul Krugman, J.W. Mason, Stephanie Kelton over the uh, Biden administration's policies and plans for uh, massive new uh, uh, spending, de deficit spending. But, their, but the work of, the Keynes, of uh, Keynes and his uh, successors did not shape uh, or motivate the growth of deficit spending, which was dominated by practical politics and embraced, embraced with particular vigor by decidedly non-progressive uh, Republican presidents such as Ronald Reagan and uh, Donald Trump. Instead, I believe their work uh, played a supporting role as a sort of elite permission slip for thoroughly populist uh, policies. The big change that came with uh, Keynesianism and its uh, successors down to the present time is the idea that spending budgets should be determined by not by <coughs> current revenues, but instead by imagined or modeled conceptions of future states of the world. The change in perspective has been warmly welcomed in the world of practical politics for a different reason. In that world, the present is always cluttered with problems and conflict and special pleading where our best days are always lying bright ahead. Every politician will tell you that. And they will be especially bright if we can just work our way through today's upheavals. Whatever else the new conception of budgeting did, it certainly liberated political calculation by, I think, as early as the mid-1970s, a new discovery emerged. <clears throat> the government would provide large numbers of voters, including middle-class voters, with direct, palpable benefits that exceeded what it charged them in taxes, kiting the difference to non-voting future generations. This was largely an American innovation because of the federal government's lack of broad-based consumption taxes as in Europe and Scandinavia, for example. Instead, we rely on a highly progressive and complex income tax system that produces relatively meager income. Indeed, the U.S. tax system has increasingly become an adjunct of the borrowed benefits policy 
a means of distributing benefits rather than a means of paying for them. Uh, this view of, uh, of the evolution of the budget policy uh, is one that produces uh, uh, estimates of uh, where we are heading uh, that are similarly uh, gloomy and pessimistic uh, to those that have been uh, suggested by others, and I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to give uh, each member of the panel two or three minutes, maybe three minutes max, uh, either to react to things that other people said or to reemphasize something uh, uh, from your own thoughts. So, uh, David, would you start? As a practical matter, um, distinguishing between investment and consumption is very hard to do, and I think uh, Chris's point about the way in which this has been muddied is, uh, is, a, is a very great importance. It certainly happened during the Reagan administration, where on the one hand, uh, the federal government was spending about a percent and a half of GDP on research and development, and that helped, give us gave, gave, helped to give us every single invention of the digital age, the victory in the Cold War, and many other enormous benefits. On the other hand, entitlement programs also rose during the Reagan administration, and you can go back and look at it either way. Uh, in the theoretical realm, uh, the great uh, uh, Canadian economist Robert Mundell, who passed away uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, argued that, it made a very Hamiltonian argument, which was adopted by the uh, Reagan administration, by the supply siders, of whom I, I am one, card carrying, uh, that th sometimes the increase in federal debt can be a good thing if it indeed reflects identifiable future cash flows uh, which are generated by the same economic policy that created the debt, but otherwise not. There's a difference between uh, well-funded and badly funded debt. So we find ourselves in a situation where China is spending about $600 billion a year in technology subsidies, vastly exceeds anything the Biden administration has proposed in the so-called infrastructure bill. Many distinguished authorities have warned that China may pull ahead of us in key industries associated with artificial intelligence, computation, and so forth. So we require a certain amount of, uh, in, of, of true government investment, uh, but we're painting ourselves into a corner by spending so much on entitlements that it's almost impossible to have that sensible discussion. That's what worries me the most. Strategically, uh, the better side of the Reagan administration should be an example to us. Uh, but because deficit spending has become madcap over the top, uh, we're compelled to attack the whole concept politically. And that makes the political argument very hard to formulate, very hard to explain to the public. I'll just leave that as a problem, which I don't know offhand how to solve. Thanks, Dave. Veronique, more thoughts? No, I, I really like uh, Chris's remarks. I thought it was a, a really interesting, a, a very interesting perspective on how we got where we are. I can't wait to actually read it and be able to kind of absorb more of it. But I want to actually um, um, just add something, which is, I talked about are investors will, going to be willing to lend us at very low rates um, when you know we're at two hundred percent of GDP or three hundred percent of GDP, and I just I mean this is going to happen. I mean these enormous um, debt to GDP ratio um, are going to materialize at some point. I was listening to Brian Riedel uh, the other day, and he. He said a number, and I, I had to go back and, and re-listen and to make and, and then lo go look at his paper to see. With Social Security, M Medicare, and Medicaid, he said that there's a hundred and one trillion dollars of unfunded liability that are going to have to be funded, or at least borrowed, because there's no way to kind of pay that with you know more taxes, in the future. I mean. A hundred and one 
trillion dollars are going to have to be bored for all of these unfunded liabilities that have been promised and, and where no one has any clue how to pay for it. And, and when you add to this the projected uh, growth in these programs independently of this, when you also, all the propensity of administration after administration to engage in more spending in a way that we can never conceive, like a few years before, we can never even imagine that actually they're going to be passing a stimulus bill. Uh, you know, like they're going to be like spending it's close to eight trillion dollars, I think, um, in in COVID relief. I mean, who could have conceived this, right? I mean, you remember the Obama stimulus was was like what eight hundred billion dollars. Um, it's guaranteed that these n high numbers are, are going to materialize. And, and this, we, sh we should be planning for it now, but there's no political will. There's for, for all sorts of reasons, some of them that uh, Chris has, has mentioned. And, and so I just, just don't see how we can continue putting our heads in the sand um, and, and not at least just kind of keep that flame away from, you know, from that, from that explosive, which is heading our way, if, if only for for future generations, and and it's just really, really alarming that so few people care. So far, so good, Veronique. I'd like so to take so take that into two pieces. Maybe Chris will will uh, as part of his remarks here. We'll take up the question of the. Well, you said 101 trillion dollars. Chris rounded it to 100 trillion, but. It's, it's okay. It's something. We're calculating out into, yeah. uh, well, what what about that? And then I want to switch back, David, to you. Also, is, is somebody going to buy these treasuries? And then I'll give my answer to that after that. But let's let's start, Chris, with you, two or three minutes on the. How about the? Well, let me let, let me say. Let me say one trillion. Let me let me say a few words about uh, both uh, uh, David's. Um, Oh, please do that, too. Uh, yeah. Remarks. Um, all of politics, uh, is, it's an argument about the future. When we're arguing, talking politics, there are problems we have today, uh, and we want to solve them so that the world is a better place. Uh, and uh, I, don't see, I, I don't see any uh, substitute for arguing between the uh, David's proposal for very large national investments in high technology uh, infrastructure, uh, in uh, cybersecurity, uh, in advanced computing, in uh, quantum computing, and so forth. Um, and we do these big, massive programs pretty well in America, so it fits with our political system, and I think it fits with the risks we're facing. Somebody else would say, no, what we want to do is we want high-speed rail between Cedar Rapids and Bakersville. Um, so we, c we can argue about those things. The difficulty is that in this world that we have built, where resources seem unconstrained, it's hard to have those arguments at a serious level because, we're not, because nobody is used to making uh, trade-offs. In a corporation, in a non-for-profit, uh, in a municipal government where there are hard budget constraints, you have serious discussions. You don't always make good decisions, uh, but there are at least serious discussions. Uh, but as between uh, uh, expenditures that are obviously boondoggles and uh, consumption for the politically well-connected uh, and uh, investments that America really needs to make right now, this, the discussion does not exist, and I think part of it uh, is because we're living in a world without, well, let's, let's do both of them, you know? Let's do both of them, and let's do some more. Nobody ever says, Carl Munt used to rise on the floor of the Senate at, when a big spending bill came up, and he'd say, gentlemen, they were all gentlemen in those days, how are we going to pay for it? And everything went on. But, but they actually had some kinds of arguments. Though. The arguments do not exist uh, today. Uh, on this business of uh, how it could be uh, and is likely to be a precipitate change, we could just have a kind of a slow uh, descent uh, into slower and slower growth. I think most people think that there will be 
surprising developments. Everybody seems to be surprised about inflation uh, in Washington uh, these days. Uh, a big increase in interest rates would be a much uh, greater uh, shock and one that would cause uh, much more uh, disruption. Um, I think that uh, what's interesting to, interesting to me and what I think has, has led to these episodic crises becoming more normal is that the federal government, and uh, both Veronique and David alluded to this, the federal government has itself become a repository of great risk. And it, the whole idea in the entitlements program, the whole idea behind the welfare state was that the government was good at social insurance. There were kinds of risks in life uh, that commercial insurance couldn't really address and the government could move these things around and uh, absorb risks on and, and uh, have a efficient social spreading of risk. But once you moved into borrowing money for the welfare state, you got a completely different dynamic where we're not moving risks around the ec economy uh, to the best risk bearers. It's all being centralized in the federal government itself. Um, and it's just kind of the government has absorbed it. So the federal government has become an enormously uh, risky uh, enterprise uh, so, that, uh, so that the risks of, uh, of mistakes becoming big and hugely consequential, such as we saw uh, in 2008, um, uh, become, uh, become ever greater. How about the $100 trillion? So, so how about so, the 100 trillion? Well, it's just it's the difference if it's the difference between current uh, revenue. If, if you look at all uh, uh, future revenues and future outlays for the big entitlement programs under current law using, you know, a range of uh, demographic uh, forecasts and so forth, uh, you find you, the trust funds run out uh, pretty certain soon so that the money that the government has essentially uh, borrowed from the Social Security program will be paid back. And so at that point, the coverage bare and the government has to uh, do something. Of course, it could, you know, there are a lot of things that it could do. But assuming that the programs keep going, there is this gap. And the gap has to be met one way or the other. Cutting benefits, uh, 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 borrowing more money, raising taxes, and there's there's that big difference. So uh, when we say that that uh, accent is, uh, accentuates uh, the debt, we don't know what is, but it, it is a debt in the, it is money in the future that we have promised to pay people, pay people through the laws that we have passed for which we do not have the money. But we haven't borrowed it. It's just that we got to come up with it sometime in the future if we're going to uh, keep faith with the promises that have been made. If we want to borrow it, David, is somebody going to buy those treasuries? Well, I think the, the question to start with is why do people buy treasuries in the first place? And who buys them for what reason? Uh, you can buy them as an income instrument. In other words, you plan to retire and you want something that pays you interest and gives you return on capital. Or you can buy them as an insurance instrument. Why, for example, would anyone by inflation index treasuries or even nominal treasuries, so-called TIPS, tr uh, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, at a negative interest rate. Uh, except for the 30-year, every part of the maturity structure for inflation index treasuries is offering you negative real yield. So when you buy a 10-year inflation protected treasury, if there's no, if there's no inflation, uh, you're gonna, gonna get back 2% less per year than you put in. You pay the government 2% to hold your money. Why would you do that? Well, you expect there will be some inflation, so you'll at least get something back. But you expect, after inflation, to lose money. And the reason you hold it is it's an insurance policy because if there's an extreme burst of inflation, then the government will pay you additional principal on those securities, and that's why Inflation index treasuries trade almost in lockstep with the price of gold. They're both a hedge against large and unexpected changes in the inflation rate. There's very little correlation between gold and today's inflation rate, but 
a very close correlation between gold and the in price of insurance for inflation as reflected in the Treasury Inflation Index Security Market. Now, when you get to the point where the government uh, is creating so much debt and prospective inflation is so uncertain, then people say, gee, you know, buying insur inflation insurance from the U.S. government that's creating the inflation is kind of like buying shipwreck insurance from the captain of the Titanic when you're a passenger. And what we saw in the case of Italy, for example, during the last several years of crisis, Italy had inflation protected securities and their yield went through the ceiling, bore no relationship at all to the inflation rate. And that's because uh, if you read the fine print, uh, Italy would have to pay you back, but it didn't say what currency would have to pay you back. And they, uh, they uh, borrowed in euros, but there was considerable fear that Italy might leave the European uh, monetary and, and, and create a new lira, devalued yeah. currency, and pay back a devalued currency. So we will have a similar situation if this continues. Uh, the insurance value of treasuries, which is a very major reason for holding them, will erode. There's already no reason to own them uh, as an income instrument. Uh, you know, if you, uh, I look at my, my expected Social Security benefits to say, gee, I own $4 million worth of treasuries. <laughs> That's, you know, if you get any positive income at all, you own the equivalent of a very, very large amount of treasuries. You know, that, that part of my portfolio just went up a great deal. So I think the answer is if you look at Italy and look at other examples where the insurance value of government debt crashed, in a, under conditions of fiscal profligacy. That's where you get into the, uh, the, the death spiral. Uh, there used to be a term called a death spiral convertible bond. We issued them for Enron when I was at Credit Suisse. Uh, and that basically said, we're going to give you uh, a bond. If we can't pay the interest, don't worry. We'll just issue more of our stock and pay you back out of that. Now, who wants to buy the stock of a company that can't pay interest on its bonds? That's where you get the death spiral. So effectively, the United States Treasury is issuing death spiral converts right now. And exactly when that will hit, I don't know. My guess is, you know, the, it's, it's a, I would say a two to five year horizon is most likely, but, but nobody really knows. Can, can I add something? I, I just want to re reiterate the fact that even for all of those who doubt that there will ever be a death, a death spiral, I mean, an alternative is not any more pleasant because it's one that looks more like Japan with you know no growth and and the the devastating impact of this I mean there's a reason why in Japan we they called it the lost decade and and you know like um, and and so I think that no matter how you look at this it's just that picture just doesn't look and of course we are likely to get a mix of both uh, more likely but no matter how we look at this, I just, I continue to not understand like that people don't want, I mean, I understand the politics that you don't want to, you'd rather kind of push it into the future. But for, for a vast majority of people, they sh sh I think we should know better. We should try to prepare, if only out of duty for, you know, for future generations and, and, uh, and even for ourselves. Um, but um, there's no political will. And there's a final thing that people, I think it's like, we're gearing up for like an actual pretty nasty battle between the bondholders and the American people in the form of pensioners. Between the pensioners and the bondholders. In every municipal bankruptcy already, there's a major tension between the pensioners and the bondholders. And, 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 and while we may in every municipal bankruptcy already, yeah, pensioners. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be, and, and, it's, and <laughs> while we may not know who's going to win, <laughs> This, <laughs> it's a pensioner for I know a who wins that one. Right? But then we have to then say, um, how does it get I paid? Mean, Chris <laughs> suggested, well, you yeah, have cutting I benefits. I, I think that's but we have unlikely to, say, to happen. How does it get you have paid? raising taxes. You have borrowing more, but there's another one. You have benefits. printing it up. Well, that is to say creating money. To that's happen. what I think the you real answer taxes. is. And that does you take you to more, but there's another one. You have printing it up. Well, that is to say creating money. That's what I think the real answer is.
And that does take you to the best place. In, indeed. Uh, if I could add one footnote to Valenique's point about Japan. Japan is a terrible outcome. But I don't think and, we can even get that. And their debt structure is uh, very different for, than ours. Because Japan has a current account surplus and enough savings to fund its own, uh, its own, its own deficit. We now have a net foreign asset position of negative $13 trillion. Japan has a positive net foreign asset position, I think four or five trillion if I recall, but something like that. So the biggest problem we have is that this massive amount of uh, seniorage, which I estimate at roughly 25 trillion, and then it's um, a will come day. undone Please. in those scenarios. Ex and then it's uh, a ugly Can I press David on one point? Please. Um, so in your, uh, your analysis is that if we are at the beginning of a spike or some period of substantial inflation, uh, that this isn't to set, we're not living in the 70s anymore. When we can call in Paul Volcker and go through several years of uh, pain and suffering uh, and get back to normal, normal being, you know, continuing high, uh, high deficits and and money pr money printing, but it's but it's not just going to be a, a a problem at the margins that we can correct. Your your, it'll, it'll your be, idea of it's significant inflation right now is that it causes third and fourth or a lot of greater complications. Sure. I mean, when 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 Paul Volcker of blessed memory saved us from inflation, uh, the euro didn't exist yet. China was a primitive economy with a per capita GDP of $150 or $200. We didn't have the competition. The alternative China's offering is instead of holding 15 to $20 trillion worth of working capital in US dollars, which may start depreciating in value at five or 10% a year, um, you can use digital currencies plus blockchain technology to track payments and use fintech basically to reduce your balances in international trade uh, and instead use information technology, big data, artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, distributed ledger technology to track your inventory, your trade, and so forth so you don't have to keep as much working capital. That's the import of the digital yuan. It's, uh, it, 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 I would recommend uh, 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 checking through a search engine the term Huawei Digital Logistics and just looking at Huawei's presentation on what they want to do with that. And that's, that's the deeper economic content of the digital currency. Uh, I know the guys who are doing it and they do want to take the world over. There we are. We could, could I slip a thought in there? Uh, I mentioned in my remarks there is this, this uh, tension between the digital currency believers, the cryptocurrency believers, who want to take currency out of central banks and out of government control in their world, and what I think is the more real world, which is the governments and central banks who will create their own digital currency, which will allow much more government control and much less limited governments. It is very frightening. Uh, uh, in that way, but once you have the uh, everything in the digital currency, uh, then to devaluate, to devalue the currency, and to solve your debt problems that way is very simple. It's all just a matter on on, on the books of everybody's account uh, in the central bank. I I, uh, I appreciated the uh, the classical Greek. Uh, story in the beginning a lot, as I said, David, but there's another one which I, I love, and I, uh, uh, Law and Liberty has, has published this story in one of my essays, but I'll tell it again anyway. It's Dionysus, the tyrant of Syracuse, uh, who borrowed a lot of money from his subjects, as the story goes, in silver, and uh, then ran out of money and couldn't pay on his debts and was going to default. So what did he do? He ordered, under pain of death, all his subjects to turn in all their silver drachma. He then took each one, each one drachma silver coin and re-stamped it two drachmas and thereby paid off the debt. Now that, that's the model, I think, of, ex of exactly where you go. And that, Veronique, you mentioned financial 
repression yeah. or financial oppression. That's, that is the model when, when governments really get in trouble, they turn to that kind of strategy of uh, Dionysius, uh, which was in a famous case in this country, the confiscation of the gold when the uh, U.S. couldn't keep up its gold promises might have been good policy, but you see the government moving to say, well, we can't pay, so bring it in, and if you don't, we'll put you in prison. Uh, the uh, premier of Turkey said the other day it would, be, it would certainly be public-spirited if you brought in all your dollars and gold and turned them in to, to help us out. That, that's the sorts of actions, I think, uh, that one starts thinking about when you get into, into true financial repression. And, and I was actually thinking that there's still a lot of things that the government can do on the cryptocurrency front without even creating their own, because if a lot of, of it is, is held in platforms like Coinbase, which went public today, I think, and I, I wonder how that went, but, um, you know, it becomes like kind of like rather than actually have to kind of track people, you just go after the platforms. Now, I mean, the real crypto people uh, are like, they, they don't go through these platforms. But I wanted to actually, Chris said something which um, uh, r reminded me something. It's like I am actually really quite amazed at um, talking about like denying kind of the pain that's in our future. There's a lot of faith in the Federal Reserve being able to get us out and control the situation. But I mean, it seems, as you've said, that actually people lose sight of the fact that a lot of the things that the Fed can do will be extremely painful. It's not going to be, I mean, it's, it's going to be, I mean, if it's throw, to throw us into a recession for however long, um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not pleasant. So it doesn't really think, it doesn't really think, seem that we have like good, um, good options ahead of us. Uh, no matter how we look and no matter where one stands about what is a like, the most likely probability between the different um, action that the government can take based on history, if, if Reinhardt is, is right that there are those five means, none of them are, are pleasant. And, and I also th I just really, again, think that it's, 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 uh, we shouldn't be, take so lightly the fact that the Federal Reserve is going to come to our rescue because it's just, I mean, if, assuming that it can actually really control things that well, uh, when things really start going bad, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be a lot of pain. And who knows whether the political will will be there, which is a whole other. Thoughts on the Fed and what it can or can't do? Well, if the Federal Reserve tries to control inflation by restricting money growth and raising interest rates at a time when debt is 120, 130 percent of GDP, what that means is uh, for every percentage point increase in the cost of raising new debt, uh, we're spending another quarter, tri uh, quarter trillion dollars in interest. Uh, this is the point Veronique was making before. So that creates a terrible constraint. Um, that would immediately cut into important programs, cut into defense, entitlements, and so forth. And in a political environment where so many constituencies are fighting at the trough, and although you know, I voted for Donald Trump, twice and supported him publicly twice. The kind of populism which he represented certainly raised expectations about what the federal government could do for many constituencies, which were topped many times over by what Biden is doing. And if you have a population which is being told by its politicians, go fight for what's really, you know, for what's coming to you from the federal government, and suddenly it shuts down what would be the effect in the body politic? It's hard for me to imagine, and I'm frightened. That's the opposite of a limited government, uh, Bruni. Well, we already are in a world that's not really limited. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't have an explanation for this. The, the, the people that I, that I called 
uh, the financial progressives, the people that are quite uh, confident that this now highly refined uh, form uh, of um, uh, money and fiscal management uh, uh, that began with, uh, with Keynes, um, uh, it, even though they have big disagreements among themselves, you know, the, 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 gr the great debate recently between Krugman and Summers and so yeah. forth, um, uh, it's astounding to me uh, how, um, uh, how unconcerned they are that they could be wrong. Because if they are wrong, the costs are fabulous. And, you know, when you're doing, in, in my little uh, world, when you're doing decision analysis, you look at, at for example, in cost-benefit analysis, you always do uh, a kind of a range of uncertainty uh, view. So you kind of have a sense, well, you're making this decision, what happens if I'm this wrong, that wrong, uh, on the upside, on the downside? Um, I can't find in these very, very sophisticated public-spirited people uh, with long tenures uh, in, uh, in government, I can't, I can't find, I, I'm, I'm prepared to accept the cynical view uh, that the people in the Biden administration are just trying to transform, just trying to get us up to maybe 25 percent uh, of uh, the economy being the federal uh, uh, government, uh, 30 percent, you know, just, you know, r ramp it up. Uh, as fast as possible. I'm prepared to believe that. I think that, you know, some pe some people think that way. Some people probably don't in the administration. Uh, but for people who devote their lives to thinking seriously and arguing seriously about these things, to be just so supremely confident uh, that one is right and everybody else is stupid when the stakes are so great, it seems to me to be a quite quite remarkable uh, phenomenon. I couldn't agree more. I think everything, in my view, uh, in economics and finance uh, is surrounded uh, by true uncertainty. That is to say, it's not only unknown but unknowable, and we have to keep that uh, uh, in mind. One of, one of my personal mottos is a Latin line which says, everything human is surrounded by dense fog, and uh, everything about the financial future is certainly that. Um, but you don't make headlines with, by saying, I'm not sure. Uh, well, they maybe want to say it in private. Do they say it in private, Chris? <laughs> we're not sure. What if we're wrong? Uh, it, it does seem, uh, seem a, very, uh, a very serious point. Um, what haven't we touched on that we, uh, we want to get back to? How about how, about how much inflation? I didn't, didn't get any takers on uh, if we have a surge of inflation, what might that really mean? How bad could it be? It's been very bad in the past. You might opine on that yourself, Mr. Moderator. I, I will opine that in general, uh, things that we don't think are possible nonetheless happen, uh, and that the very fact that everybody is so sure that the inflation can't be very high makes me think maybe it uh, we will again uh, be surprised uh, and that it could be much higher. Uh, one of my little uh, recurring thoughts is how much, well, first of all, what is a price? Inflation is, has to do with the, the, with, the, with the exchange rate between the, the money unit and everything else. It's a kind of a price. Uh, how much can a price change? Well, first of all, a price has no objective existence. Price, you said things are ruled by ideas. A price is an idea between two contracting parties. Um, it has no objective existence. How much can a price change? A price can change, my answer is, more than you think. However much you think the price can go up or go down, it can go up or down more than that. And, and I think that's true of inflation as well, and the, and the it is, highly costly when it does. Uh, of the dead, speak nothing but good. Uh, David mentioned what he called the sainted Paul Volcker. But the sainted, sainted Paul Volcker's uh, uh, solution to uh, uh, getting inflation not to zero, but just to lower single digits, uh, 
was extreme uh, unemployment, extremely painful contraction, a heavy contribution to the Rust Belt uh, and all its problems. Uh, these things are not, these things are not, uh, are not costless. So I, I, I tend to believe that maybe uh, uh, my friend uh, Charles uh, Goodhart and his, and his co-author are right, that we could be looking at a much higher uh, rate of inflation coming, and not just as a, as a single event, but over time, uh, uh, than we think. But I, but I admit that uh, it's surrounded by, surrounded by fog. I, I think your point before about the discrepancy between 11.5% uh, year-on-year rate of increase of housing prices and the year-on-year -year increase of the shelter component oh, yeah. of CPI of, what is it, 1.5%, I think, that certainly is a cognitive dissonance, and it's basically the result of the, bank, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics confusing stocks and flows. If you have an asset, what is the rent on that asset? If I own a house, what would I pay myself to live on it? That's called owner equivalent rent, and it never made any sense. Um, but since the base most important expense that American family has is to buy a home, inflation for American families is through the ceiling. And temporarily, uh, they got a break on cars. Uh, vehicle, new vehicle price inflation has not been that high, but now with the world semiconductor shortage and a 25% drop in auto production in the first quarter of this year, uh, new car prices have to go up. Used car prices at auction Already are up 20% year on year. That's not being measured. You don't see that in the CPI, but the auction prices for fleets of used cars are those you know, and they're up 20% year on year. So in the two biggest items in the family budget, which is your car and your house, inflation is through the roof. It's in double digits already. So yes, could that trickle down to single digits? Absolutely. The constraint is, if you have to pay workers more, uh, you may stop hiring them. If you have to uh, pay more for a car, you may stop buying a car. So the stag part of the stagflation comes in when there's resistance. And then you also have uh, another effect Mundell used to write about. If you're destroying people's wealth by increasing inflation, they'll save more to compensate for that so they may stop spending, and that's another contributor to stagflation. The one thing that none of us are any good at that I know is predicting consumer behavior. Maybe some genius in China with some big data <laughs> algorithm has, has some way of fixing that, but market economists are just lousy predicting consumer behavior. The, the people have a mind of their own, so what the trade-off is going to be between the stag and the flation and stagflation is inherently unpredictable. Whatever it is, it's not going to be pleasant. Um, I was hoping I was going to get a response from you, Chris, out of my thought that we're all Nixonians now, echoing Nixon's own famous line that we were all, we were all Keynesians at the time. And, and you pointed out in your paper, Chris, uh, that Keynes himself was not a perpetual deficit theorist. He was he was an overtime balanced budget believer. He was believer. a balanced budget man. Over time, over time. Over the fiscal year. Yeah. Over the over the cycle. Of, or of something. The, uh, yeah. Cycle. Um, that was his original view. That but that was Nixon was wrong. That was never tried. Uh, the f the first step was tried. Uh, that is uh, uh, running deficits. But the idea uh, that growth or surpluses would uh, be used to pay down the debt <laughs> when times looked up, uh, what, hap what we found out was that when, when times got better, everybody said, well, that stimulus really worked. Let's <laughs> keep it up. You know? um, yeah, and this is one of the things that's really is changing and moving fast, which is like in previous um, emergencies and events, um, there was at least an attempt to root the action of the government, the spending, into economic theories, whether they be Keynesian or, you know, the neoclassical, like uh, filling the output gap and things like this. And and like right now, and that was the big debate between Krugman and, and Summers, is, is, is that 
on the latest COVID bill is like precisely that Summers was saying this is wrong because it doesn't actually, it, it just, it's way too big to be justified by the, by the, by the, the tools we, we used to use to, to justify such level of, of spending. There's been, there's been really actually a, a shift um, this way. And that's, that's, I think, pretty, uh, pretty significant. And we, we see it. I mean, it seems like we're in a lot of the, the theories that even economists are, are using where like there's a big kind of return to the, uh, to the 60s and 70s that we, have, we haven't seen since then. And it's kind of, I'm, I'm curious, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to it, but to see how it develops. Financial uh, and economic ideas cycle. We, we are, I'm gonna let this be one, we're down to about three minutes left now, so I want to give okay. everybody a last chance, and this is yours, Chris. Okay. I'll, I'll just to continue, can I have five? Let's do it yours. He can have five? He can have mine. He can have yours? <laughs> you gentleman bleeding, he, okay. Um. <laughs> An example of how things can turn unexpectedly. Our last two, and this, Nixon, um, his, uh, when he came into office, uh, he had a budget surplus. In fact, our last two periods of, of budget surplus were created at the end of Democratic administrations, uh, LBJ and, and Bill Clinton. At both times, and I, I was there, I was actually on the inside in 1969, um, uh, we were talking about, we, we had, the, the big thing was we have this big piece, we have this big surplus. What are we going to do <laughs> with all this money? <laughs> and um, uh, it was it was a big part of just it, we, we weren't we didn't have a big debt to pay down. We were kind of that had been, you know, always being doing that. So we were talking about new spending programs because we had this enormous <laughs> surplus. We didn't know what to do with at the beginning of the Bush administration. Um, everybody was talking about how um, uh, uh, how we could actually wipe the debt out in 10 years or something now. That was different because we had a sequence of awful surprises uh, and events uh, coming up. Uh, but, but I think that if we if we look back, even without those events, uh, the deficit would have begun begun to boom. And in the in the Nixon White House, we were astounded. We got into nineteen halfway through nineteen seventy, and the surplus went away. And I mean, it went away within a couple months. And things were going to get better and better. And now. Suddenly, you, d you did the calculations, and things turned radically differently, and nobody saw it coming. You, you may remember that the subtitle of one of my books is, is Why We're Always Surprised in Finance and Economics, and those are great examples. Peter Wallison invited me to give a speech at AEI before I was part of AEI. Um, if, the, if the surpluses continued, this is the late 1990s, and there were no more Treasury securities, what could the Fed do if it couldn't buy treasuries Everybody. anymore? Everybody. I gave yeah. it to him. So there we are. Uh, I think we can confidently predict that we will be surprised, uh, maybe as badly as David, as you're thinking, or we're all fearing. But anyway, given, given the hour, uh, let me thank the panel for a great discussion. Uh, and again, thank our sponsors for having us. It's an excellent time, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. And, and let me say to uh, Veronique, Alex, uh, David, and Chris, appreciate your participation. And this panel will be available shortly uh, on Law and Liberty and the Real Clear family of websites uh, for others to view, and as well as your opening remarks. We look forward to that. Uh, thank you for co sponsoring tonight. And uh, this has been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>